Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Candace Sapp, and I use she, her pronouns. I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, um, and I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Kofi Essel today. Dr. Kofi, um, Kofi Essel is a board-certified community pediatrician at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., Dr. Essel serves as Assistant Professor of Pediatrics, the Director of the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences Culinary Medicine Program. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Um, the Director of the George Washington University Community Urban Health Scholarly Concentration and the Director of the George Washington University Clinical Public Health Summit on Obesity. Dr. Essel has dedicated his career to advocacy and research around healthcare and public health workforce training, health disparities, and communication, community engagement. With expertise and national recognition in the areas of addressing diet-related chronic disease, obesity stigma, and food insecurity in families. Dr. Essel sits on the National Academy of Sciences Roundtable on Obesity Solutions Lived Experience Innovation Collaborative and was nationally recognized by the Alliance for a Healthier Generation for helping to create an innovative curriculum to enhance pediatric resident trainee skills on nutrition-related disease management. Dr. Essel sits on the board of directors for FRAC and is a physician advisor for the Partnership for a Healthier America's Veggies Early and Often campaign. He also co-authored a national toolkit for pediatric providers to address food insecurity in their clinical settings with AAP and FRAC. He is the principal investigator of a large multidisciplinary population health initiative that aims to strengthen community clinical ties to address diet-related chronic diseases in historically marginalized settings in Washington, D.C. Dr. Essel has received numerous local and national awards for his professional practice, in addition to being selected for the top 40 under 40 leaders in health award by the National Minority Quality Forum. So as you can hear, Dr. Essel is um, well uh, regarded in the, this field, and I actually had the opportunity to hear him speak um, earlier this summer in May at the anti-hunger um, Policy Conference in DC. And so I'm really excited to um, hear what he's going to share with our audience and our MCH team today. So without further ado, I turn over the screen to Dr. Essel. Awesome, awesome. Can, can you hear me? Can I get a thumbs up? Yeah, you sound Beautiful. great. Excellent. Okay, so I'm excited to dive into pillar two today. Uh, pillar two, focusing on integrating nutrition and health. That's going to be my focus. It's going to be our focus today over the next hour of time. Let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, so with pillar two, um, with our focus on integrating nutrition and health, there are a few things that they are prioritizing in pillar two in the um, White House agenda. Number one, uh, prioritizing the role of nutrition and food security and overall health, and also ensuring that our healthcare system addresses the nutrition needs of all people. These are important aspects that we really want to highlight. There are three aspects of this that I really want to bring together that, that are categorized under this pillar two. Number one, uh, we want to make sure that we're providing greater access to nutrition services to better prevent, manage, and treat diet-related diseases, thinking about using food as medicine solutions in particular. Number two, we want to make sure we screen and not only screen for food insecurity, but intervene effectively. And number three, we also want to know and make sure that we're strengthening and diversifying the nutrition workforce recognizing that the nutrition workforce can uh, benefit from added diversity, whether racial ethnic diversity, whether expanding nutrition education uh, to other providers as well, so they can be more equipped to be able to have some of these basic discussions as well. Not to be dietitians, but again, to bring in a different concept and different component uh, so to engage patients and families as well. So these are the areas that we're gonna be focusing on uh, as we go through. My objectives today are simple. Uh, number one, I'm going to discuss the state of nutrition training in medical education. Number two, we're going to explain how interdisciplinary approaches to integrating nutrition and healthcare uh, setting improves patient outcomes. And then we're going to also discuss importance of using food as medicine as a solution to optimize health. And lastly, um, I'll give some practical strategies to integrate food as medicine in healthcare settings and systems. Uh, let's go ahead and dive on in. So when I think about this topic, I wanted to really frame our conversation today. And, and in order to frame it, we have to understand some of the data. And you all are, who are on the phone, you know this data, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. But we know 
that poor diet or poor nutrition is one of the leading risk factors for increased mortality and also increased morbidity, right? Quality of life decreasing. We understand that it's quite clear. When you look at the data, what do we see? When you look at chronic diseases overall, you see that about 60% of US adults have at least one chronic disease, about 60%. When you go to two, we see at least 40% of US adults have at least two chronic diseases. Now, when you focus in specifically on diet-related chronic diseases, there are a few things that I think are important to really understand. Let's start with hypertension. One in three adults, U.S. adults, have hypertension. We talk about obesity often. Three out of four U.S. adults have either overweight or obesity. When you think about diabetes and prediabetes, what do we see the numbers to be? One in two U.S. adults have either prediabetes or diabetes. And what many of you may know is that many individuals may not know they have prediabetes or diabetes. So that is a huge factor in itself. Now, with this fact, I think it's important to understand and call out diabetes. Diabetes adds one of the, uh, the highest costs on our healthcare system. For every $1 spent, or one out of every $4 is a better way of saying it, one, of a, one out of every $4 spent in healthcare goes towards diabetes in particular, right? And, and you can break that down in a variety of ways. But if you think about it in general, we spend about $327 billion in healthcare costs towards diabetes. About 70% of those dollars are uh, on direct medical costs and about 30% of those dollars are on lost productivity. So we understand this to be a big burden on the healthcare system. And we understand that food and nutrition can end up being a leading risk factor to triggering and leading individuals towards having diabetes, type 2 diabetes in particular. So this is something that we understand. Now, with this added cost in the healthcare system, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation did a wonderful analysis looking at the role of food security and diet-related chronic disease on the healthcare system. And we're looking at nearly $1.1 trillion of spending each year as a result of these factors. So we recognize that the risk is high. We recognize that this is a very prevalent issue that we need to do something about. So as a result, you would imagine that we as healthcare have done a phenomenal job training the next generation of providers to be equipped to be able to talk about this topic of food and nutrition. Let's look at the data. What we've seen in the data is quite interesting. At minimum, at baseline, we say that there should be a minimum of 25 hours of nutrition education provided in medical schools to prepare the next generation of providers to be amazing at what they do. 25 hours is the baseline minimum. What do we say around that? What do we notice as, as a matter of fact? We see that uh, the majority, 70% of these schools uh, don't provide even those minimum number of hours of 25 hours. What else do we notice? A third of these schools don't even provide half of those hours. When you get to your third and fourth year, those practical years of medical school where you're in the ward, seeing patients in the hospital, getting a lot of practical skills, we see that the majority of programs don't focus much of their time at all in incorporating nutrition education or nutrition tools in terms of teaching students how to engage patients around these tools in medical school. So in general, what do we notice? That there's very limited education around nutrition and medical training. It's clear, we understand it, it's a problem. But of course, it may be different when you're talking about resident training and fellow training or, or faculty, they must be much better trained, right? Well, the data is pretty clear there too. We see that residents, fellows, practicing clinicians, they all say the same thing. We do not feel prepared to engage this topic with our patients and our families. At the same time, we all consider ourselves experts on food and nutrition. Why is that? Because we all have our own lived experiences with food and nutrition. We all recognize how food and nutrition makes us feel. So although our knowledge may be lacking, our ability to communicate with our patients sometimes is overwhelming. In terms of, we say a lot of things to our patients sometimes that may not necessarily align with the data. It's things that we may have tried, things that we've heard, things that may be good to consider. But oftentimes these are are stewed in stigma and bias towards our patient, not recognizing cultural background, not recognizing the diversity of palates, not recognizing the importance of meeting our patients where they are. So there's a challenge here. There's a gap here. 
and these gaps need to be filled. And pillar two highlights the importance of improving nutrition education for medical providers. Now, one of the areas that I think is quite unique and has been a phenomenal godsend in getting us to be aware of the importance of talking about nutrition and medical education is a renewed focus on social determinants. This idea of social risk, of social needs, recognizing that, hey, it's not that a family has a diet-related chronic disease, so just eat more fruits and vegetables. It's about realizing that there are a multitude of other factors that influence the health outcomes of our patients and our families. And once we become aware of that, then we become more sensitive to creating more strategic and beneficial public health strategies and having more empathy in our clinical spaces to be able to meet our patients where they are. One of the most important social determinants or risk factors that we often talk about, especially in this discussion around diet-related chronic diseases, is what? It's food insecurity. Food insecurity, what is food insecurity? When all members do not have consistent access, all members in a household do not have consistent access to enough food to live an active and healthy lifestyle. When all members in a household do not have consistent access to enough, I will label healthy and nutritious foods to live an active and healthy lifestyle. We all heard this definition. We often interchange this word with hunger, although it's technically different, but to understand it at the way we want to understand it, we can overlay it in today's conversation. So we understand that people experience hunger. We understand that this is a big factor in influencing the health of populations as well. With a renewed focus on social determinants, a renewed focus on food insecurity, we saw professional organizations around the country really take this on. For example, the American Academy of Pediatrics, they put out a policy statement in 2015, groundbreaking policy statement addressing this for the first time, really encouraging providers in clinical spaces to advocate for policies that end childhood hunger, to screen and intervene in clinical spaces, to bring this up and to, to figure out ways that we can do a better job of uh, addressing this topic in the clinical spaces that we're in. The AAP policy statement said this, pediatricians can play a central role in screening and identifying children at risk for food insecurity and in connecting families with needed community resources. Really powerful statement, a powerful uh, statement that you all could read it when you get a chance. Another group that came out was ACP, the American College of Physicians. They said this, they believe it is imperative for the United States to make it a goal to eliminate food and nutrition insecurity and recognize the fundamental right of adequate access to healthy food. These goals and actions are aligned with longstanding ACP policy. This is something that we are saying it aligns with what we do as doctors. We need to be addressing this. How do we address this well? You also have the American Hospital Association. They said this, food insecurity is a social determinant of health that should be accounted for in any population health strategy. Food insecurity affects the health status of individuals and families on many levels, so hospitals are treating it as a health care issue. We have a renewed focus on bringing this to the forefront, recognizing that to improve the health of patients and families, we have to think about the systems that influence health outcomes as well. When you look at some of the national trends around food insecurity, what do we see? Why is this such a big deal? Well, in general, the most recent data from 2021, the national data, what do we see? So in general, when a recession hit, you can see here from about 2001 to 2022, when recessions hit, you can see spikes in food insecurity rates. You can see this last spike reaching levels up to 14.9%, all households experiencing food insecurity. These rates went down significantly over time. And then that we thought with the onset of COVID, with us seeing the long lines, with us seeing, you know, the, the increase in SNAP use, uh, food pantry use, food bank use, we thought that there was going to be another significant spike as well. But nationally, what did we notice? We noticed that some numbers were high, some numbers were low, but in general, we saw numbers remain steady from the year prior to COVID. What does that tell us? It tells us that when we have the political will, we can actually do this in a more positive way to help to buffer and even reduce food insecurity. What do I mean by that? You think about all the policies that came out that really supported families and helped to buffer food insecurity, supporting SNAP, taking off some of the burdens to be able to onboard into SNAP, allowing SNAP maximum benefits to increase. All of these kind of changes, WIC, 
enrollment. All, all these things really supported families. In addition to the charitable food response was significant as well. You saw a vast, a huge number of families taking advantage of food pantries and banks in a way that they hadn't before. It became a part of the national dialogue. The most recent data in 2021 showed us that we're at our lowest rates that we've been in in 20 years, which is no different than that 10.5% for the most part, but about one in 10 households experience food insecurity, about 10.2% of households. Now, when we look at households with children, what do we see? We see again with recessions, we see a spike in numbers. We see with COVID, we actually did see a little bit of a spike from 13.6 to about 14.8%. But then the most recent numbers in 2021, we see that the numbers have been the lowest that they've been in the last 20 years as well. Again, speaking to the importance of that strong political will, speaking to the importance of addressing this in a way that it taps into our resources that really make a difference. When we talk about this topic, it's sensitive, but we need to talk about the importance of how all poverty is not created equal. What do I mean by that? When I started to look into COVID-19, when I first started to explore it, what did I start to see? Well, I used to call it the great equalizer, right? At first, I would hear about prime ministers, Tom Hanks, all kinds of important people. I heard about people with great wealth, people with not so great wealth getting COVID-19. So I felt like, hey, this is equally affecting us all. But as we continue to gaze more and more into COVID, we realized that it was more than the great equalizer. It actually was the great magnifier, magnifying the inequities that had existed all along and finally being thrown into our face and it faced in a way that we had to do something about it. For example, the first few months um, after COVID, um, looking at food insecurity rates, looking at a special tool that was used by the USDA, what did we see? We see that all households increased significantly when it came to food insecurity rates, all households, but some households increased more than others. These rates, these, the prevalence of food insecurity was already off. It wasn't consistent with all households by race and ethnicity, but we see that these, these uh, inequities actually spread. They became worse when we started to see them a little bit more closely. So what did this highlight? It highlighted the systemic injustices, racism, these other factors that influence what we see today when we look at these disparities that exist across the board. 10.2%, you may say, well, that's not that big a number. 10.2%, I mean, there's 90% of people not affected by that. What is this really telling us? This is telling us about 14 million households about 34 million individuals, about 9 million children are experiencing these toxic and palpable stresses of food insecurity, where on average, most families experience this about seven months out of the year. Families going to bed hungry, families experiencing these toxic and palpable stresses. And this is an, a disservice that shouldn't be the case. And that's why you see that pillar two really highlights the importance of screening, identifying this, and then connecting families to meaningful resources. When you look across the board, we see that some families are affected by food insecurity more than others. Some families have higher rates or higher prevalence of food insecurity. You can see families with poverty, even all the way up to 185% of the poverty line. Single parent households, communities of color, households with children, rural and urban settings, households in the South, single men or women. You can see these households being higher. And you may say, well, I just need to really look for these households when I identify families experiencing food insecurity. But the reality is, as Feeding America has shown us, is that food insecurity is actually ubiquitous. There's no county in this country free of food insecurity. In fact, I also like to describe food insecurity as being invisible. If you rely on these superficial signs, weight changes, um, you know, certain signs, you're using certain kinds of insurance, your sh how you may look, these superficial signs do not tell you anything about a patients having food insecurity or not. And in fact, Food insecurity is an invisible factor, and we need to use powerful screening tools to be able to identify if families are experiencing it. Because if we leave it up to our own biases, we're not going to get anywhere with that. So you may ask yourself, like, why does this matter? Where did these two worlds come in with food insecurity and diet-related chronic diseases? Well, what do we see in the data? We see something really interesting. Food insecurity is actually associated with worse cardiometabolic disease. Look at what this study showed us here. This study was an uh, analysis looking at different NHANES cohorts, and we see that when families experience food insecurity or individuals experience food insecurity, they have higher rates, statistically significant higher rates of these conditions, things like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, 
even obesity. These are things that we see. So we know that this association is quite significant and other data points have shown us this as well. So it's not just food insecurity by itself, but it's that this is associated with worsening cardiometabolic disease, which in itself, we talked about, these diet-related chronic diseases tax our healthcare system. They tax the health and the satisfaction and the quality of life of our patients and our families as well. So you may ask yourself, what do we do? We, we talked about food insecurity. We talked about diet-related chronic disease. Is there a way to kind of bring these worlds together? Is there a way to think about how we can address this work more effectively? Well, one of the ways in which we do that is a term that many of you may have heard of, but if you haven't, let's introduce it today. Food is medicine. You may say, well, I've heard it being called food as medicine. I heard it called food was medicine or food will be medicine. It doesn't matter what word you use in between. Food is medicine is a concept, is a strategy, it's an intervention that focuses on collaborating, working alongside healthcare to either prevent, manage, or treat diet-related chronic diseases with increasing access to quality food. This is also an intervention that can be used to address food and nutrition security quite effectively as well. When you think about food as medicine, there's a pyramid that a lot of people often talk about. And this pyramid I'll show you is right here. This pyramid is looking at the different levels of addressing or using food as medicine as a tool. At the bottom, you can see tools that are used in prevention. Uh, at the top, you're seeing a, a greater focus on treatment. So you can see at the bottom, you're seeing sort of population health food policies and programs, policy councils, policy that we're intervening with, uh, sugar tax policy, different things like that. As you go upstream, you can see here government uh, nutrition security programs. You can say programs like SNAP or WIC or school meal programs. These are programs that we know can be quite effective and evidence-based in improving overall health outcomes, reducing poverty, reducing food insecurity, and the list goes on and on. These top three are, are programs I wanna focus on a little bit as well medically tailored meals, medically tailored groceries, and produce prescription programs. These programs can be quite effective and poignant at addressing diet-related chronic disease and food insecurity, and let's dive into those. And I'll start with uh, program number one, medically tailored meals. These are sometimes considered the most expensive of these programs. They have some of the most robust data RCTs being done, control groups being seen, really effective data. We still have a lot of questions like we do with all of this stuff, but in general, we see the effectiveness with these interventions. Typically, you're providing more than 50% of the caloric needs of a household or an individual. You're also providing foods that are pre-prepared, right? These are items that are pre-prepared and oftentimes delivered to families. They're designed by dietitians to oftentimes meet a need. So addressing diabetes, hypertension, rehospitalization, different conditions like that. And these are really great programs that you can see being used all around the country. The next category of programs I call is medically tailored groceries. Again, not just produce, but produce plus, right? Thinking of things such as uh, whole grains, uh, beans, uh, other items as well that you could be incorporating into these packages as well. The amount of food typically varies. You're, you're typically giving, again, a mix of produce and other grocery items. The cost of this is going to be far cheaper, right? Because you're not preparing items, you're not pre-preparing items. These foods can be delivered, they can be picked up, they can be used through a food pharmacy approach as well. And the last category I want to focus on is produce prescription programs. These are, again, another really powerful strategy to use food as medicine. Again, at cheaper cost, you're only providing produce. It can be fresh, frozen, or canned. And these are uh, items that are used, sometimes designed to improve overall health of families as well. And you may say, well, what evidence do we have that these programs work? It's food. Like food can't really be medicine, right? Well, we know that these programs can be effective in a lot of different ways. We also know there are a lot of questions that we have around the dosing, the frequency, all these things we still want to really dive more into. But what do we know? We know that these programs can be quite effective in decreasing ED visits, decreasing hospital readmissions, improving overall dietary intake, decreasing blood pressure, decreasing food insecurity rates. The list goes on and on and on. And it's important that we understand this and recognize what we can do to use this as a tool to address diet-related chronic disease and food insecurity. So pillar two, what does it do? Pillar two, it encourages us to use food as medicine to improve access to nutrition services. Pillar two encourages us to screen and intervene to address food insecurity. And pillar three, or pillar two also highlights the importance of strengthening and diversifying 
the nutrition workforce with education and also with creating strategy to improve the diversity that we see across the workforce. All right. So in order to do this diversity, and when you do this diversity, we know we then are able to do what? Provide healthcare with systems that address the nutrition needs of all people. And this is another important piece that we have here. So I want to give you a case study application of this work um, that we're talking about around Pillar 2. So in 2016, um, I, I was part of a team that rolled out food insecurity screening within all of our clinics, our primary care clinics at Children's National in Washington, D.C. We see more than 40% of the kids in the District of Columbia. A lot of uh, opportunity there. And you can see that the policy statement came out in 2015. We we're one of the leaders in starting to roll this out and learn strategies to do this effectively. Here's a toolkit on the side that we worked on in 2021. This is the most recent toolkit that trains providers and equips providers on how do you screen and intervene effectively, recognizing the power of screening and then intervening to improve the health of patients and families. Our providers were saying a few things. They said, hey, you know, um, we like these programs. Our, our, I didn't know food insecurity existed in the rate that we're seeing it. it. It blew my mind. And when I saw this patient and I saw what they were wearing or what they brought in, I never could have imagined that they had trouble experiencing food insecurity. They also said, hey, I want to give my families more meaningful interventions. A piece of paper with resources, yeah, it's great. It's, it's, it's fantastic. But the reality is well, that piece of paper oftentimes doesn't leave that exam room. It oftentimes doesn't make it into the trash can. It oftentimes doesn't even you know, go down the elevator with them. It just stays where it is. It never comes out of the purse or the bag or the pocket. We want to think about strategies that we can create better warm handoffs, strategies that we can create what we call clinical community collaboratives. We look for different models that were out there, and we came across a really powerful idea uh, designing what we call clinical community collaboratives. These collaboratives allowed us to work with community partners, share data back and forth, prioritize health equity, and center the family in the middle of everything that we were doing. This became a really important piece for us in our design. So we started doing this work in the city and the community, and we realized there were great partners who are already doing some fantastic work. Community-based organizations already being recognized as anchors in community who are doing phenomenal work that, what would it look like if we partnered with them? They're already doing phenomenal work. How do we bring our forces together? So what we did was we designed an initiative. We call this FLIP, the Family Lifestyle Program. We brought together the YMCA, Children's National and the American Heart Association. And we designed FLIP to be an intervention that created more meaningful strategies that address diet-related chronic disease and food and nutrition security through a family-centered lens. We really wanted to focus on uh, creating healthy families and healthy communities and what we were doing. And this is our initiative that we created. You can see some of our team members here and some of our funding support that we've received as well here. We have a community advisory board that oversees our work and has been part of our work from the very beginning as well. Now, I'm a pediatrician and, you know, a lot of this work uh, around food is medicine. Um, you know, we don't often think about young kids. We don't often think about children, right? We're thinking about adults and the, the, the burden of disease is, yeah, it's oftentimes with adults. That's where the highest cost is. But for me, it's always important that we realize that we cannot forget about that next generation because that next generation ends up becoming older and then has that layered diet-related chronic disease that we may see. So how can we think about doing this in a more meaningful way and think about addressing conditions early on? One of the groups that we often forget about in particular is our youngest of children, those who are the age of um, the first thousand days. You all may know about the first thousand days, and this is a group I really want to highlight in our conversation today. The way I want to start this conversation is by telling you a little story. I remember when I was a resident in training and becoming a budding pediatrician, learning everything from books and thinking I knew everything. I remember sitting in front of a patient. They brought in a four-month-old, a beautiful family like you see here today. I remember the family looking at me and saying, hey, Dr. Kofi, you know, we're excited. Our child is growing. We're ready to start solid foods. And we want to figure out how do we go about doing that effectively? What, what is this? What do we do? You know, we hear that this is important. And they looked at me and, and I realized I didn't have the answers to what they were really looking for. And I looked around and I realized I'm by myself. I need to figure this out. 
So of course I run out to the attending, the head doctor who knows everything. And they realize, they come back into the room and share an information. And the advice that's given is also not very valuable to the family. The family leaves not feeling fulfilled, not feeling they had an answer or strategy in how to address this topic. And I realized at that moment that we failed this family. I realized at that moment when I started asking my colleagues around the country and realizing that they also had no experience in this topic and didn't know how to communicate about strategies affecting children around nutrition, especially our youngest children, I realized something. We have to do better. We are missing an opportunity. The first thousand days, the brain is developing incredibly fast. We have opportunities here where sudden insults to the brain, certain traumas to the brain can cause permanent changes for their life. So we have an opportunity here to transform the palate of young children, create a palate that enjoys the adventurous appetite of a variety of fruits and veggies and umami flavors and earthy foods and sour and bitter, or we can just get them used to one flavor. This is an opportunity that we were missing out on. I wrote about this in AJPH a few months ago, and I was talking about the opportunity for pediatricians to intervene in those first thousand days, recognizing all that we know in those first thousand days. We know that 90% of adults don't consume enough vegetables. You can say fruit or vegetables. And then if you think generationally or behaviorally, we see something else that's interesting. 90% of children don't consume enough of the recommended fruits or veggies. This is a problem. If we're not consuming enough of them, we can imagine some of the issues we may be having, issues around our microbiome, issues around consuming enough fiber, and issues around constipation and bloating and all the other issues that can be a result of these as well. We know that this is a big factor that we're seeing here. When you look at the data, we see something interesting. When you think about how many families or what families are consuming, we understand that the strategy that oftentimes we talk about for adventurous eating or for getting young children to eat a variety of foods is what? You got to give those foods multiple times. That's all you got to do, right? Just keep giving it. Eight to 15 times is what some of the data tells us, right? And I've seen numbers all over the place, but let's take it here today. Eight to 15 times on multiple days. If you just give those foods eight to 15 times, your young children will enjoy them. They will start to adapt to these different foods. Their palate will transform. That's all you have to do. When we say this and we don't think about the systems and the environment that some patients are in, we're missing something. A lot of times when I may communicate this to my families, what they may be thinking, the first thing they may be thinking is what? Waste. If I'm giving a food eight to 15 times, I may be wasting this food seven to 14 times. That waste may be too much of a burden for my family to handle right now because of the challenge around food access, getting quality food to improve our lifestyle. What do I mean by that? Let's look at um, a pathway or sort of a, a continuum when we think about food insecurity in families. When I think about food insecurity in families, I typically think of a few things that happen. We have a financial her a hardship that suddenly occurs. With that financial hardship, the first thing that oftentimes drops, drops is what? Is food. Why? Because that food budget is so flexible. That food budget is so fungible. So as a result, we see food oftentimes decreasing. What do we mean? So the first thing we tend to see is this idea of food anxiety, a constant preoccupation, perseveration with where one's next meal is going to come from. That oftentimes, that food anxiety, what one of my colleagues out of UCSF says, Dr. Hillary Seligman, she describes it as a decreased cognitive bandwidth that can occur. Right, So one's cognitive bandwidth, the ability to shift and focus on many things becomes hindered because of this very nature of this toxic and palpable stress of food insecurity. What happens after that occurs? Well, the first thing that we tend to see after that is the quality of food begins to drop. We call this a monotony of the diet. The diet becomes very monotonous, very simple. We're getting the same things over and over again. Why? We don't want to waste those foods. We often, oftentimes may gravitate towards foods that are higher in sugar, salt, and fat. Why? Because these ultra-processed foods oftentimes are a pop-off valve for the brain, the dopaminergic relief, the, the, the gravitation towards those foods, the, the feeling that comes from consuming those foods. Those foods oftentimes are also cheaper. They're hyper-palatable, easier to access as well, which also may adapt and change people's behavior and also purchasing patterns as well. After you're seeing this variety decreasing, right? And we talked about with food insecurity, this waste concern. After you're seeing this occur, the next thing of course that happens is the quantity of food decreases. Adults love their children, so adults will decrease their food intake first. And then lastly, children will decrease their food intake last. Now, 
adolescents and uh, younger or older, younger children, they oftentimes will describe in the literature that they'll decrease their food intake as well. They oftentimes know what's going on in the home, although parents are trying to protect them from knowing about food insecurity. They oftentimes will eat less so that their younger siblings can eat more. So that toxic and palpable stress is felt through this whole journey for families, even if there is not a decrease in the quantity of food. I love how Ellen Satter, um, our famous dietitian, says this. She overlays Maslow's hierarchy with food insecurity and kind of puts these two worlds together and shows us a really nice model here. If you look at this model, what do you see? The first thing that families are oftentimes trying to achieve is not getting those novel new foods that what I often say, that kale quinoa bowl that you may recommend from the clinical office, but they're oftentimes trying to get enough food. If you think about the first thousand days from conception, right, to age of two, if you think about those first thousand days with that incredible rapid uh, brain development, especially after birth, what do you think is happening? Families are trying to do something in particular. They want to make sure that their children are getting enough food. Sometimes we may say, don't put any cereal in the bottles. Uh, stop giving all those other foods, stop giving all those, those other drinks. But sometimes they're like, forget all that other stuff. I just want to make sure my child is growing. When they come to see you in clinic, I want to make sure that their weight is getting, you know, growing. You're giving me those positive affirmations. My child is smiling. I want to make sure that they're getting enough food to eat. That becomes the priority over those novel instrumental foods. And sometimes if you think about that with challenges around food insecurity and waste, if I'm getting the same foods over and over again, and I want to make sure the child's eating these same foods, you can imagine how that affects the palate diversity of families that experience food insecurity. And if it limits the palate diversity, imagine how that future will affect their palate as they're going, growing older and continue to buffer or reduce, attenuate the consumption of a variety of fruits and veggies, whole grains, other foods that we know can be incredibly valuable and improve health. We have an opportunity here early on to intervene. We're not doing enough here. And this is a great opportunity that we can think about when we do these kinds of interventions. We also have to understand that the system is not really helping us too much either. Infants naturally accept sweet and salty flavors. We all are born with a natural predilection, desire for these flavors. So when you look at the data, what do we see? When you look at the data and you see grocery stores across the country, when, you, when they studied over 500 different vegetable containing products, what did we notice? Less than 10% of these vegetable containing products are vegetable only or vegetable first. What do I mean by that? These foods that are incorporating veg veggies, their flavors are covered by fruits oftentimes. What does that mean? Well, so we're getting kids to enjoy what they already enjoy. Why not diversify the palate? Some would say, well, we're giving kids what they want. We're giving families what they want. When you give these foods, a child smiles, the parent gives it again. Well, we understand that with the palate of young children, sometimes it takes multiple tries. Even if they make a face, they're probably going to come right back to it. Don't say, oh, it's because I don't like broccoli. That's why my child didn't like that flavor either. But you got to keep giving it. But it's really a hard message if we're not delivering it in the right way. And also, if our systems are not encouraging variety of flavors as well, we can understand how that would influence the behavior of our families. So the question I ask is this. Could food as medicine be used as an intervention to support the health of young children in the first thousand days? Could food as medicine be used in this population? Something we probably don't explore as much, but something we really wanted to think about more. So we looked at this food as medicine pyramid and we said, let's focus on produce prescription programs in particular, so we can diversify the palate and really help families diversify and create more adventurous eaters that could optimize the health of children and families. So we created an initiative under our FLIP umbrella. One of the initiatives that we have under FLIP is FLIP RX. It's our produce prescription initiative. This program is for families that are experiencing food insecurity, at risk for food insecurity, and other diet-related chronic diseases, and are less than the age of five with this initial intervention, the majority of them being less than three. This was an intervention that we did. We tried out, we tested, got some seed funding from No Kid Hungry, to really get this program off the ground, which we were really grateful for. We started our intervention providing produce from local farmers, really trying to highlight our black and brown farmers in our local community as well, every other week for 12 months. That was our initial intervention. We coupled this with uh, nutrition education where we sent videos to our families that we created with videos from families, local families, and we provided those, that education to our families in addition with providing a once a month 
virtual cooking class for our families as well. We noticed a variety of things that occurred as a result of this program. So this is, some of this is unpublished and we'll share that here. In general, we saw an increase in fruit and vegetable intake. But one of the things that I thought was powerful is what happened as a result of this intervention. Here's one family, they said this, I mean, for the new ones or the new produce, there was no better situation for me to use them. Um, I didn't have to necessarily pay for them. And if we didn't like them, we know that we never have to buy them again. Or if we did like them, hey, we just sampled this food for free. And now we know that we can add this into our repertoire. It allowed me to see uh, what my son does like and what he doesn't without me spending money on buying these foods. Another quote, sometimes you're afraid to try new things because it's like, if I buy this and no one likes it, is my money going to waste? We've talked about that earlier as well. A few more quotes for you. We are so used to eating only certain fruits and veggies. Again, limited variety. Now we have a variety of fruits and veggies that we can eat now. So it has broadened our horizons around these foods. Some of the produce I really uh, didn't think my son would like, but once I made them, he liked them. So if he likes it, I'll keep making it. You'll see this strategy happening where the child starts to consume different foods, and then the parent starts to change the purchasing habits as well. When we're going to the grocery store, she, my daughter, goes straight to the produce aisle and gets our vegetables. There is a transformed uh, interest in this work that may be occurring with these kind of interventions. I said it like this, produce prescription programs may play a beneficial role in increasing diet diversity and quality in families experiencing food insecurity and diet-related chronic diseases. What do I mean by that? I think one of the things that produce prescription programs allows us to do is it creates a lab, an environment in which families can test and taste foods without having the anxiety, the fear, the worry of waste. They test and taste foods multiple times. And you know what? They start to adapt to the taste of those foods. And then guess what? It starts to change their purchasing habits as well. These are opportunities that then may affect the whole family as we scale these kind of programs up. This is just one of the findings that we had with our interesting program, but there's so much more here that we can dive into. Now, what do we know with um, the White House Summit? There was over $8 billion um, in commitments that were made. These are powerful commitments that were made across the board. And a lot of these commitments were made towards pillar two agenda items. And if you think about some of those agenda items, I wanna highlight some of those right now. The ACGME, which is the accreditation body for graduate medical education in medical schools, right? So residency and fellowships in particular. They hosted their first ever summit on medical education and nutrition, bringing together experts from around the country to figure out what are ways that we can actually move this agenda forward. You can see here pictures from this amazing conference. Um, I had a chance to talk about the cultural and structural aspects of nutrition and really making sure that we don't forget about that when we pr provide nutrition education. I'm here with Dr. Angela Odoms Young as well. Here's me with one of, uh, or here's one of my colleagues, Dr. Jacqueline Albin um, out of UT Southwestern doing great work in culinary medicine. It was an amazing opportunity to bring uh, some, some amazing faces together to learn from, to bring some voice to this conversation and to help to move this agenda forward. We also talked a lot about culinary medicine. Here's me with some of my uh, culinary medicine students teaching about the power of food and nutrition through experiential learning. If you think about food and nutrition learning, you can th sit about, think about getting taught through a didactic session where you have a teacher and you have students, top down kind of approach, which can be quite effective. But the opportunity for experiential learning is quite powerful as well, where we get students, faculty, residents, community members in the kitchen spaces, and they're cooking and learning together. They're learning the power of food, not just nutrition, right? Because oftentimes families want to hear about food and don't want to hear about the details of nutrition. So this gives us a powerful opportunity. We talked a lot about this being a viable option to train providers as well. We talked a lot about, or we didn't talk a lot, but this is another intervention that was done through No Kid Hungry. Uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, they teamed up together promising to train over 67,000 AAP pediatricians on both how to screen for nutrition security and how to intervene to address this more effectively. Again, building off of Pillar 2's recommendation. The last one I want to highlight is some of the work that our team was able to work with, uh, with PHA, Partnership for Healthier America. We created clinician handouts to help what? Address uh, this topic, food and nutrition security, um, and providing early education in these first thousand days uh, for our providers. 
really take some of that burden off of them. And I want to highlight this again. I want to emphasize this because I don't want to make, I want to make sure this is not missed. We don't want our providers, or as in the clinicians, uh, physicians at that, to be dietitians. Dietitians are doing a phenomenal job. You know, we, we encourage that. We want to continue to refer to dietitians. But there are a lot of issues that are going to come up in our clinical spaces where we're not going to be able to refer to a dietitian. We don't have a dietitian available. And we need to provide instant sort of direct strategic advice and guidance. And we need to have that awareness. In addition, as one of my colleagues says, we want to make sure that we are doing no harm. Because a lot of what we've done in the past is provide a lot of harm around food and nutrition, not recognizing a lot of what we talked about before. So we want to do this in a way that does no harm. So it's important that we do this work effectively. And this is a tool that we use to really support providers all around the country. Here's some of that toolkit here. You can see seven guides that go from pregnancy or, or from conception all the way to 24 months of age providing information in English and in Spanish. We've done a sensitivity re review. We did focus groups. We did multidisciplinary teams to get insights from different people as well. Here are the, the guys that you can see here. Really, again, going from that conception state all the way to the age of two. We provide safety guides, thinking about providing or, or feeding sort of foods that are um, hyperallergenic. How do we sort of do this in a way that reduces allergy as well? Right? There's all kinds of meat in this as well that uh, providers are now using quite commonly and it's a great tool that brought together the Dr. Young Project out of Spotsylvania, Virginia and Partnership for Healthier America. I'll end with this slide. We have great momentum that we've built and we can continue to build great momentum. The time is now, the season is here for us to dive deeper into this topic. Pillar two has given us the framework in a lot of ways to be able to, to build off of some really powerful opportunities to use food as medicine, to address food insecurity, and more importantly as well, to diversify the nutrition education workforce. I want to thank you all for your time today, and I think I have a few minutes for a question. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was great. Um, and I do have some questions from the audience that I want to go ahead and um, feed to you. So uh, one of the questions was about the terminology, food is medicine. And um, since you are a pediatrician, uh, do you use the term food is medicine with uh, children and adolescents, or do you use a, some different verbiage um, that might be more, I don't know, appropriate for that audience? Yeah, I, I think food is medicine is a great term for our research, for our strategy, for our public health agendas, for our missions. Um, I would never, um, I don't say never, but I would rarely use food as medicine as a term that I use with uh, patients and families. Um, if I, I don't use it as a term, but I would describe food being a powerful tool to improve our health and could serve similar to being like a medicine for us. Um, so I do want families to recognize that food has great power in the health of in our health. And I think it's oftentimes not given the chance it deserves. We as healthcare don't give it the chance it deserves and as a, not as a result. But in addition, the systems that our patients and families are in oftentimes don't recognize uh, food and nutrition as being, um, or, or it confuses food and nutrition for patients and families. So they don't really, oftentimes it, there, there's a lot of confusion about what we should go to, where we should go, how we should eat, uh, the, the different kinds of food we should eat. Is this food ultra processed or not? But it says it has vitamin C in it. So isn't this better? You know, so there's just so much confusion around it and we have to provide more clarity. Um, not just us, systems, public health, all of us as, as a cohort need to really support families in that. Awesome. And there were a lot of questions and um, not questions, but a lot of comments about the RX program you were discussing. A lot of people loved it. Um, and there was a question kind of about sustainability. So, um, Say you're providing a produce prescription program for 12 months. What happens when uh, families, participants are no longer a part of the program? What can we do to uh, maintain those behaviors and those um, lifestyle modifications that they've learned? That's such a great question. And I think we're all trying to learn and figure this out together. I think there's a, a variety of aspects here. For us, what we did, and I didn't mention this, is that we've trained uh, navigators, patient navigators, to receive referrals from families or from physicians or other team members, community health workers, social workers, any other team members. These patient navigators do a few things. 
They one, identify what challenges uh, families have and mm -hmm. connect them to meaningful community resources, local resources, but also federal resources, right? Mm -hmm. SNAP and WIC. We know there's a huge drop off in WIC after age one. We know with cash value benefits it mm -hmm. itself, WIC can serve as sort of a produce prescription program. There's so much benefit with these federal nutrition programs that we want to support families on that can really provide families with added support over mm -hmm. the course of that year. Again, on average, most families experience food insecurity about seven months out of that year. And these federal nutrition programs can provide more of that longitudinal support in times of hardship for families. So we think that that's an important aspect to this, undergirding these programs with some of these stronger federal resources than as needed and beneficial. In addition, um, what we hope to do is we're giving families tips and strategies to then be able to transform the purchasing power, so that the foods that they're purchasing, how you double up your bucks with SNAP, how do you use your food and stretch your, your dollars, how do you uh, store the produce better and the different items like that better as well. So hopefully some of those tips are important as well. We don't prioritize that as central because I don't think the first strategy to address food insecurity needs to be, this is how you say you spread out your money, right? You know, when you look at SNAP spending, for example, um, I'm sorry, I'm rambling a bit, but I got a little time, so let me, let me throw this in here. When you look at SNAP spending in particular, when you look at older data, you can see that by day seven, by day seven, you receive all your benefits on the, the benefit card. By day seven, you see about 60% of spending being completed by day seven. By day 14, two weeks in, you see 80% or more of spending being completed. You have 20% spent uh, or left for that last two weeks. So you're going to do a variety of different things. I'm going to see how I can stretch it. You can see hospitalization rates increase. You can see adult caloric intake decreasing. All kinds of things happen at the end of that month. So we want to make sure we're thinking about strategies that can optimize and, and, mm -hmm. and provide and advocate for policy that's securing and strengthening SNAP spending or SNAP dollars. And we recently went up September of um, October of 2021 to about $1.80 per person per meal, which should help. You know, there's different things that we're doing. We want to keep advocating to provide adequate resources to families to be able to support their own nutrition security as well. Yeah, I love that. I love that you're using a systems approach. It's not just putting all the burden on participants to make a change, but looking at policies, the environment and everything. Um, and, and you you touched on the community navigators. Um, one audience member asked like what food insecurity screening tools did you use in the, some of these interventions and were the community navigators the ones maybe screening for food insecurity or um, somewhere else along the process? Great question. So as you remember, universally, we started screening for food insecurity in all of our primary care clinical spaces in 2016. The screener we use is a two question hunger vital sign screener. That is one of the most dynamic, easy to incorporate tools to determine if a family is at risk for food insecurity. I would encourage those who are using the screening tool to not use the yes or no dichotomous variable. That dichotomous variable will miss about 20 to 30 percent of positive or uh, affirmative responses. I would encourage you to use the often true, sometimes true, never true, or refuse to answer, don't know answer, um, because that will increase response rate and comfort for families so they don't have to kind of pick a side. There's a lot of anxiety around these kind of questions and families will oftentimes pick that sometimes true category, which tells you nothing about severity because the two question screener doesn't tell you about severity. It just tells you about at risk status. When the mm -hmm. family is recruited into the program and onboarded, one of the surveys that we do is a more extensive six item USDA survey, the short form. So that short form gives us the opportunity to determine severity of food insecurity. That gives us a chance to determine marginal food security, which in itself, not, con not considered technically food insecurity, but it itself is associated with disease outcomes. We look at low food security and very low food security. And one of the things that we often see with these kind of programs is it shifts families from very low to uh, lower rates or off of food, uh, food insecurity to you know, marginal or, or no food security. So I, I think that's also another powerful thing that we see. We were, I was really interested in looking at the 18 item tool, but it just adds a lot of survey fatigue. So we try not to use that. So again, that's the tool that we use in our clinical spaces, but you know, there's so many ways of incorporating the we can tool, prepare. A lot of them use the two item tool or use one of the questions from it. I think at the end of the day, the questions are great, but I think more importantly, practically, we need to also add a question in there, just asking them, do they want resources? Because at the end of the day, a family may choose to not answer, and that's okay. We shouldn't have to or burden our system or burden our family on having to 
elicit this response for them to get the support that they're looking for. And also families may say that they have food security, but these benefits may still be quite effective. And also, you know, the specificity and sensitivity of the screening tool is great, but it's not going to catch everybody. So these are just things to think about if you all are implementing these in your own settings as well. Wow, that's awesome. Um, the questions are rolling in. Uh, people are really engaged in this topic. Um, so one audience member was asking, I guess, when you look at um, disparities and inequities in food insecurity, um, they were asking about uh, the prevalence among American Indians. They did not see that in um, on the slide. And I am hoping that I'm reading this right because I also see reservations. So I, when I say American Indians, we're talking about um, native indigenous um, people to the US. So can you speak to that? And maybe that wasn't what your study was actually looking at, like that specific group of people. Yeah, thank you for that, um, that point. Um, some of the data doesn't tease that out, but when you look at the data that does tease that out, we see that the American Indian Alaskan Native population has some of the highest rates of food insecurity. Some of the highest rates, one or two, right? Highest rates, two or three times higher than majority population, right? So that's a quite, quite positive uh, group. And also when you look at rural settings, American Indian rural settings, there's a lot of challenges around accessing food, but not only accessing food, right? There, there are grocery stores, but it may not be the store that you want to access. So sometimes there's increased burden about getting to the grocery store that gives you that food sovereignty, right? Yeah. Purchasing foods that are meaningful to your culture, to what you eat, to what means life to you. So there's a lot of challenges around that as well. But in general, that population has very high rates of food insecurity. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, and another audience member, there's, they were questioning about medically tailored meals. So they said, you know that you discussed those earlier, but um, have you done any work about medically tailored meals for children with special health care needs? So maybe like developmental um, needs or even inborn errors of metabolism or anything like that? Or, yeah. So I personally haven't done any work and I, I can't now think of any literature that's coming to mind that's done that. I know that a lot of the medically tailored meals organizations, I work with one in DC called Food and Friends. Um, there's one in New York called, God, called God's Love We Deliver, really powerful organization doing phenomenal work. They, off, they oftentimes are focused on adult conditions, you know, uh, A1C risk factor high, you know, this high, certain conditions. There are oftentimes a few for pediatric settings that they, they try pilots around. Oftentimes mm -hmm. these aren't well as well funded, but like mm -hmm. with cystic fibrosis or certain conditions, there are, there are different interventions that they use around that. I think that that is a very viable population. If you're not, if somebody is thinking about that, yeah. let's get it, let's go, let's do it, let's test it, let's see how effective it is. We know that these interventions can be quite effective. Food itself is a great tool for increasing health. Let's try it out. Um, I haven't seen a lot of the data around that though. Well, sounds like a good research gap. So yep. we might have some students on here. That's maybe a dissertation or thesis topic. So that's great. Um, I know we're down to two minutes. And um, before I check for any more questions, I wanted to see if you had a take home message you wanted to give the audience or a call to action or just a nugget that you wanted to leave on the top of people's head. So. Yeah, let's do it. Um, food is not the answer to food insecurity. Mm -hmm. Food is but one of the approaches we can use to addressing food insecurity. To address food insecurity effectively, to address these conditions that we're talking about effectively, it's gonna require systems change. We have mm -hmm. to think about systems. That's gonna be an important piece of it. We have to use our voices, every one of us on this phone, uh, whether you have your own lived experiences with food insecurity, uh, professors who have had their own lived experiences, whoever you are on this phone, and I say phone, I mean Zoom, um, let's think about how we can use our voice, our voices or advocate to bring the voices of those who we work with to the table to really influence change. Take away some, I mean, there's so many restrictions around some of these programs around, oh, you know, um, racist policy agendas that limit people from access. I mean, there's just so much stuff that we can do here that I think is gonna require us to go upstream and do this in a way that's more effective. Child tax credits, federal programs, um, you know, thinking about how we can support families in a more meaningful way as well and equipping them to, to live the life that they're trying to live. I love that. So 
thinking more in upstream solutions, systems minded. So I think that's something we can all work on and apply to the works wherever we're um, at in our communities. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Essel. We have some more questions that we didn't have time to, um, to answer, but um, I'll be sharing the questions with all the speakers. So if y'all have time, like, they'll be able to look at your resources and your organizations too. Thank you Excellent. again. For thank you all for having me. Have a great day. Bye-bye.